You're listening to Market Champions, a podcast on navigating the financial markets. Here's your host, Shabas Prakash. This episode of Market Champions is brought to you by Simplify ETFs. For more information, visit simplify.us. No simplified funds will be discussed during this podcast. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Market Champions. I just wanted to remind you to like, subscribe, and leave a comment. Really helps the page grow, really helps the podcast grow. Thank you so much for your support. And now on to the interview. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Market Champions. Today we've got Jim Leitner. Jim Leitner is the founder of Falcon Management, a family office. He was featured in Steve Jobney's famous book, Inside the House of Money. And this is episode 200. So it is awesome to have you, Jim, to sort of commemorate this episode, but also um, just to get your thoughts on what's going on in markets right now. So thank you so much for being on the podcast. Hi, Sri. Happy to be here. Happy to do this again. Second time with you. Yep. Second time. So this is awesome. And so, Jim, um, so the one thing that's on everyone's minds right now is this Russia-Ukraine situation and how this plays out. So how are you thinking through the situation? And, you know, from a market pers- uh, perspective, are there any risks that have not been priced in yet where, you know, there might be an opportunity? You know, risks that have not been priced in is really a hard question. Um, I think that we don't have common knowledge yet how these risks are going to play out. You know, we know we're in the middle of a war and now there are different paths that people are putting probabilities on, like, you know, a ceasefire might happen soon or not soon. You know, the war might get worse or not worse. Um, So I don't think those are risks that are not known. I think they're just very hard to put odds on. Um, My personal view is that uh, unfortunately, it feels to me that the next two, three weeks are going to still be very, very rocky and very rough in the Ukraine. I don't see um, the Russian government pulling back. I don't see them changing their um, pounding of cities rather than engaging in, you know, a aggressive forward move. It seems to me that just using its artillery to just destroy cities and try to break the spirit of the Ukrainian people. Um, And so my fear is that this is gonna last another two, three weeks, during which period of time we're gonna have a lot more negative news. And, you know, I think the markets are um, a little bit, maybe too optimistic that things are gonna work out better than what I expect. I mean, we could see that in commodity prices you know that about, I don't know, 10 days ago or so, uh, oil prices on um, Brent shot up and went to over 130. Then we collapsed back down to just under 100. And now we're back at 116. You know, so it feels like the market's unsure. Where are we going next? Are we going back to test the highs again? Are we going to break down? And, you know, when I look at that and I put the probabilities that I see, which is that things get slightly worse rather than better over the next two, three weeks, um, it confirms to me that I want to continue to trade commodities from the long side. Yep. And, you know, in your recent interview with Alex Gurovich on Real Vision, you sort of, uh, you you mentioned that, you know, you've been buying some ags, um, the BCOM um, AG, which is the agricultural sub-index of the Bloomberg Commodity Index. And so do you sort of have an update on that, on that trade? And you know, sort of as, a, as I guess, the um, outlets of that trade, um, have you been looking at, say, fertilizers, et cetera, which have also been going through the roof at the moment? Right. Well, you know, I think the ag trade is um, just at its beginning. You know, the um, oil trade is somewhat more dependent on economic growth. And we have the Fed, which is raising rates aggressively, and in the last couple of days has actually kind of induced rates to skyrocket even more, you know, going from kind of built in 25 basis points to hmm, a much larger probability of maybe we'll be seeing some 50s. 
So, you know, oil is probably uh, something that in a panic goes higher too, but ags, I feel, have very little to do with what the Fed is doing. You know, people have to eat. It doesn't matter where interest rates are. And, um, you know, after the war started, I started looking at um, agricultural exports Ukraine and from Russia. And I realized that, you know, they were very large agricultural exporters. So, you know, in terms of wheat, Russia is the largest exporter, Ukraine is the fifth largest. Uh, in terms of corn, they're high up there. Um, also in terms of sunflower oil, sunflower seed oil, which is used way more um, than, than we would expect. And very large percentages come from the Ukraine, which is a huge sunflower seed producer. You know, it made me kind of think that um, that trend of higher ag prices is going to continue. I don't think it's all built into prices yet. Um, it also coincides with the climate change droughts that we're having in other parts of the world. You know, so Brazil's had less rainfall than we'd expected. The the U.S. West has less rainfall. You know, all those things are, I think, leading to, you know, potentially much higher prices. Um, some of the investment banks, for example, on corn are calling for prices as high as 12. We're now at seven and a half. So, you know, those are not built into options yet. You can definitely buy options that can make you multiples of the premium you pay um, to take advantage of something like that happening. And, you know, with the very defined downside, you're paying your options premium. Um, the other thing that I think people haven't really focused on enough is that these higher prices for ags are causing real pain around the world. You know, Turkey, uh, Lebanon, Egypt, Bangladesh, they're all very large exporters. 60% or more of their grain exports come from Russia and Ukraine. That is really difficult to replace when, you know, it's not clear how much of Ukrainian grain can even get out of the country. You know, it's hard enough to plant in the middle of a war. It's hard enough to harvest, but then you still have to get it from your farms to ports to ship it out. And right now with the Russian advance along the southern front, you know, you're seeing Ukrainian ports coming under tremendous pressure. And, you know, I think uh, this could lead to higher inflation in these countries, but also in terms of uh, politics, it leads to, you know, people being in the streets, people are suffering, people are uh, wanting change from their government. I mean, uh, you know, some of the analysis that goes back to the Arab Spring, you know, had to do with higher food prices at the time. People said, you know, the reason the Arab Spring happened was that we had had food inflation. People felt food insecure. They were just on the verge of protesting. And then it just all exploded when prices went higher and people did protest and governments fell and things changed. So. I think we might see a lot of political instability still coming. Um, you mentioned fertilizers, you know, that Russia is one of the largest fertilizer exporters. Um, and, you know, again, um, without fertilizer, the yield on the agricultural production falls. Um, fertilizers imported from Russia are super important, especially in Brazil. So, you know, this, this war has worldwide um, implications. And, you know, I think the ag market kind of pulls them all together in one price. You know, it's uh, interesting to see that, you know, fertilizers and exports and war all come together to be reflected in the uncertainty of where should ag prices be. And I see kind of like a uh, fat tail distribution in that on the side of much higher prices, the probability is asymmetric compared to much lower prices. You know, like we're not suddenly gonna grow a lot more corn or a lot more wheat and uh, replace the production lost. So I, you know, I continue to say that one needs to buy um, 
Becom Ag or um, individual commodities, I've started buying um, soybean oil call options, thinking that um, you know, as sunflower seed oil starts becoming more difficult to source, people switch. So, it, you know, it's in general vegetable oils that I think will bear the brunt. And since there's a reasonable liquid futures market in soybean oil, you know, with options, um, it's a place to take a position. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, the, the, the war also shows, um, you know, some really interesting um, European sovereignty issues. So, you know, we've had over 2 million refugees, 1.6 or 1.7 million fleeing into Poland. And they're bringing with them cash in their pocket, hryvnias, you know, and they need to eat. They need to buy themselves, you know, necessities of life even though the Poles and the Romanians and the Germans, people who have been taking in refugees have been incredibly generous. But, you know, at some point people need some cash. And it's really interesting that, you know, the European Central Bank has actually not been able to provide liquidity in the cash market for euros to Ukrainian refugees. All that has happened at the regional level with non-euro banks. It's interesting that like the Polish Central Bank is working with the Polish State Bank on providing approximately the equivalent of 300 euros to refugees against Hrdnia. So who's taking that exchange risk, right? It's the Polish Central Bank taking the exchange risk because no one really knows what a currency from the Ukraine is worth in the middle of a war. Right, I mean, officially it's a fixed at the pre-war price, but in the market at the border, you know, I hear that the price is now 300% higher and who knows where it really could be. And, um, you know, the fact that the Polish Central Bank, which is not part of the ECB European monetary system, um, is able to react quickly and come up with a plan on how to support the refugees. Um, it's kind of interesting in that, you know, the wealthy ones, Germany, France, Italy, all the ones who are part of the ECB, you know, have still just dithered around the edges because, you know, they don't want to be accused of doing monetary policy easing by, you know, guarantee, by taking in Herudnia at a uh, exchange rate that they determine and taking that risk. You know, they, they are looking for some fiscal authority, some government authority to take that risk on. Um, it just tells you that sometimes when you build institutions, you don't think about all the problems that can occur and you then structure them in such a way that, you know, when problems occur, they're not able to respond quickly and effectively. Whereas you know, the Polish Central Bank actually has done a really good job. I, I gotta really give them credit that, you know, they stepped up their plate. They see a problem, they're addressing it. Finding it, trying yeah. Trying to figure it out. So, you know, it's kind of, if you had to put kind of a grade, like you give, you give the Polish Central Bank an A and you give the ECB a C and you say, you know, it just doesn't make me think that Europe has figured out how to use its economic might in a way that makes the world a better place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. And you know, you know, uh, you, you also uh, you you know while you were discussing ag, you know, you also mentioned places like Brazil. And so, you know, in your interview with Alex Gorovic, you also mentioned that you know you were long the Brazilian real. So you now, are you still long? And you know, when it comes to EMs, you know, are there any op are there any other opportunities you're watching, say like Turkey? Etc. And how would you go about assessing, you know, the risks and the opportunities sector? So, you know, I'm a believer that commodity prices in general probably are going higher. Now, I just don't think the war is going away that quickly. I think we have, you know, the whole climate change issue. I think we have a conversion towards electricity from carbon-based fuels. So that's you know, supportive of things like copper. Um, 
So I have been looking at emerging markets, which are net exporters of commodities rather than importers of commodities. And of course, Brazil immediately stands out as a major export of commodities. Also, the Brazilian Central Bank has been very aggressive in stepping in when they saw inflationary pressures develop and raising rates quite aggressively. You know, we're now in double digits and not that long ago, we were down at 3%. I mean, that's an incredibly strong statement by the central bank and it doesn't look like they're about to stop raising rates. Um, so I have liked Brazil. I also think that in the next election, if um, Lula were to be running against Bolsonaro. Lula has an advantage. And, you know, Lula was president from 2003 to 2011. Um, you know, when he came in, there was all this fear of a populist, leftist, oh, Brazil was going to become ungovernable, it was going to be a terrible place. Yet, he turned out to be relatively relaxed and, um, you know, a champion of the people the Brazilian currency actually strengthened from about, I don't know, it was about 320 or so in 2003. I don't have my Bloomberg screen running to about two or 195 in 2011. So, you know, there were lots and lots of things that happened during that period of time. You know, we had the great financial crisis, et cetera, yet Brazil ended up doing okay. So, you know, to me, the politics, can improve in Brazil. The central bank's doing a good job. Commodities seem to be fine. And, you know, Brazil today is at 490. It's when, uh, when I was talking to Gorbich, it was probably like 515, 520. Um, Pre-COVID, so December of 2019, the currency was at four. So we're still about 20% cheaper than where we were. And um, it feels to me like an opportunity that over time we could be long Brazil while holding it. We earn, you know, three quarters of a percent a month um, in positive carry. We're a long commodity exporter. Um, so to me, it's one of my larger currency positions. Um, my largest used to be the Chinese currency. And I'll cut that in half um, because you know, China seems to want to stabilize the currency and not allow it to appreciate anymore. So there's no reason to be sitting back and just holding that. Um, I wouldn't touch commodity importer like Turkey, where I think the government and the central bank are you know, working on the economic model that I don't really understand that lower interest rates are going to lower inflation and you know, they seem to be increasing volatility rather than calming the markets down in general. Um, I do have a small Indian rupee position in that, um, you know, the forwards are so high that if you look at digital options, um, a three-year digital option struck at today's spot price for the Indian rupee costs about 10%. Um, so if nothing changed, you'd make 10 times your money in three years. Now, will things change? We'll see, you know, but they're paying, but India is becoming an interesting place for manufacturing exports. You know, as people are changing uh, and diversifying their supply chains, you know, people are moving somewhat out of China, um, looking for other places. I think India is, you know, a country of 1.3 billion people has an attractive internal market, is attracting some more capital flows. So even though their commodity importer rates are high enough, the volatilities are low enough that you can structure some options bets that I wouldn't think are as good as what I can do in Brazil, but I'm happy to have some, uh, some Indian ones. The other one I'm really um, have increased the position in is Ch uh, Chilean pesos. So Chile is the largest copper exporter in the world and copper producer. And, you know, as we said earlier, I think over time, the world is moving towards electricity away from carbon-based fuel. So, 
if you look at electric vehicles, it takes something like four to five times as much copper per car in an EV uh, than in um, internal combustion engine. Um, and as people slowly switch, I think that means there's demand for copper. Um, and I think, you know, the more electricity you use, the more copper you use in general, because a lot of electricity is transmitted across copper lines. So, you know, it might not be as clear a case as, as some of the other currencies, uh, some of the other commodities, but you know, for the long term, I kind of think copper is fine. And Chile, again, has a uh, positive carry. Uh, interest rates are high. The central bank was quite aggressive at raising rates about six weeks ago. Um, so I have been building up a portfolio of long emerging market currencies, mainly using options, digital options, uh, which I think price quite well. Um, and I think it fits into my view that in the big, big picture, the next 10 years will be a dollar negative time. You know, we've seen the dollar go up now for about 10 years or gone sideways the last one year. It obviously depends on which dollar you look at. Like I said earlier, dollar Brazil went from four to five or 560 at the highs, 560, 570. Um, but you know, the, the things are changing. Number one, historically, when the Fed has started actually raising rates has been when we saw the peak in the dollar. Maybe this time it'll be different. Maybe this time the dollar will continue to appreciate. But then the question of course always is against which other currency? You know, one of the reasons the dollar has looked like it's appreciating so much is that the euro has always been a big part of the basket against which you measure the dollar. And the euro has been super weak because you know they've had these negative interest rates. They seem to have quite a few problems in trying to figure out you know what Europe stands for. Um, but I think things are changing there too with this Ukrainian uh, war situation. Germany has finally, I think, turned the corner and given up the what they call the Schwarzen Null, which is the kind of like. Uh, fiscal um, non-expansion, you know, over, over the cycle basically don't have any fiscal deficits. And I think, you know, Germany is now willing to spend significantly more money on defense and Germany is willing to spend significantly more money on energy independence from Russia. And that means that, you know, they'll be building new ways to use solar, wind, other alternative things. Maybe they will not shut down the nuclear power plants as they had planned to do. You know, I think it's um, always a little bit um, kind of ri riotous to me to see that some of the Europeans are so against nuclear energy, but they don't mind importing electricity from France, which, you know, 75% of its electricity comes from the nuclear power stations that EDF has. So, you know, I think, um, I think in the big picture, Europe is pulling its act together a little bit more than they did before. Um, the central bank clearly is now thinking of tightening eventually given that inflation is running really high. So I think once interest rates, not just in the tenure sector, but actually in the short date and money market sector go over zero and are positive, you know, you'll start seeing that there are some more flows into Europe. So Europe becomes more attractive. Um, that means the dollar is slightly less attractive, relatively speaking. Um, and then on the politics, you know, the sanctions against Russia, I think, were important. I think sanctions have all kinds of ethical implications. You know, they hurt a lot of people who have nothing to do with the war. You know, when insulin prices go up because you can't buy insulin, that doesn't hurt Mr. Putin. It hurts a lot of people who cannot get insulin. Um, and sanctions are hard to get rid of. But the one sanction that I felt was actually quite interesting was when the US and the European allies um, sanctioned the Russian Central Bank. 
So the central bank has about $630 billion worth of reserves, a chunk of which is in gold, but a lot of the rest was in European sovereign bonds and deposits. And you know, reserves are supposed to be there during a period of stress. So <laughs> here we clearly have a period of stress and suddenly the central bank could not get to those reserves. Well, if I were a reserve holder, I would be starting to think about, hmm, are these reserves really gonna help me when I really need them? And you know, at this point, approximately 60% of reserves around the world are held in dollars. And the US has kind of made pretty clear that you might not have access to those reserves if you know, the, the reason you need them is that you have just done something that we strongly disapprove of like invade another country um, or you know, what we're doing in Venezuela or what we're doing in Iran. So you know, if you're a reserve manager, you need to really think about what, do I, what am I trying to protect myself against? Like, what am I gonna do with these dollars I don't have access to if something bad happens? What do I really need? And so if I'm a Chinese reserve manager, I would be suggesting that we build much larger stockpiles of things that we might actually need, like oil, wheat, rice, <laughs> copper, you know, and those would be reserves that we would have access to because they'd be in China. Um, and I'd feel the same way probably in India. You know, I think lots and lots of reserve managers and reserves worldwide have grown dramatically are thinking that they need to look for alternatives. And again, I think that supports commodity prices further because I do think that you know, the reason you have reserves is so that you can buy things that you need to, that you used to have to import, which for many countries is commodities, certainly for China, certainly for India. Um, so I think in a big, big picture, I can see the dollar's role as reserve currency decline. It won't go away for sure. But you know, even if it goes from 60% to 55%, it's the trend that matters. Financial markets tend to price changes, not absolute levels. So you know, as people start unwinding some of that, then I think we could see a dollar decline over a multi-year period. So I am looking for places outside the US to put currency bets on. And that's why I'm right now along these emerging market currency bets, but I have not yet bought developed market currency bets. I have not bought the Euro, I've not bought the Swedish Kroner. Um, I'm buying some Australian dollars. Why? Because I think, again, Australia is a large commodity exporter. It ties in with my commodity theme. You know, would I be surprised to see the Australian dollar 10 cents higher a year from now? No. There's nothing magic about it being at 70 for today and being at 84 a year from now, you know? So that's the kind of thing I'm doing. I think that the Fed, you know, people are seeing that the Fed is very aggressive at trying to raise rates now, but, you know, real rates are still negative. And even forward looking real rates are still negative. So it's not that clear um, that the Fed has really been able to tighten the financial system enough at this point. So where does that leave us? Well, I'm really um, hard pressed to think about where inflation is gonna be. Will it be higher or lower? Or the base effects say that it should be lower because higher bases are, you know, are dropping out so that like car prices that went up a lot, or used car prices are going to be dropping out from a year ago. So that should kind of press inflation lower. On the other hand, there are plenty of things that are still going up, like rents. And, you know, at this point, if the Fed really wants to slow down inflation, they need to slow down the economy. And they're trying to walk a really fine line. They want to find a soft landing with lower inflation. And will they be able to achieve that? Well, there's some probability that they can, 
but I can't see that that would be a very high probability. So I think they're being optimistic, but even in their own forecast, they're saying that, you know, unemployment will be running around three and a half percent. Well, if the kind of neutral rate of unemployment seems to be about 3.9 to 4%, that means you know, we're running above potential. And in order to slow the economy down, you need to actually create some unemployment. Otherwise, you know, you're not slowing the economy down. And the way the Fed historically has thought about you know, the impact of monetary policy is you know, through something called the Financial Conditions Indicator, the FCI. <clears throat> yep. So I tend to follow the Goldman Sachs FCI, which is on Bloomberg. It's composed of five parameters, right? Short interest rates, long interest rates, credit spreads, the value of the dollar, and the level of the equity market. So you have those five. And altogether, you know, if equities drop, well, the financial conditions get tighter because that means there's less in investment and you know, some of the animal spirits are gone. People will not be hired as much. If interest rates go up, same thing. You know, if credit spreads widen, the same thing. If the dollar goes up, that tends to slow the economy down because it's harder for us to export. So if you look across those indicators, yes, the FCI from November when, when the said when Powell for the first time kind of started talking a little tough has become more restrictive. So at that time, the Goldman Sachs uh, financial conditions indicator was at about 97 or 0.97. I'm not sure how they scale it. And now it's at like 0.98. So it's gone up 1%. Yet you know, about five days ago, it was at 98 and a half, and it's dropped back down to 98. And the reason being that the equity market just rallied, you know, 6% or so in the last five, six days, uh, trading days. So, yeah, it's very hard for the Fed, it seems, to actually really move the FCI higher without seeing the stock market drop. The FCI tends to, t seems to be willing to go higher much more easily when the stock market drops. Um, the increase in interest rates does not seem to have tightened the FCI by enough to really slow inflation down. So if you think that they're gonna to have to raise rates further in order to raise the FCI, at some point the stock market will be vulnerable again. And to me, that's going to be another dollar negative because I think part of the reason the U.S. stock market has outperformed so much over the last 10 years, when you compare it to the European stock market, for example, it's up, what, like three times what the European stock market's up in the last 10 years, 12 years. Well, there's been a huge amount of foreign flow into U.S. equities. I mean, all you have to do is look at the portfolio of the Swiss National Bank, which, you know, when you go on Bloomberg and you check Amazon or Apple and so on, you can just look at the largest holders and you find the Norges Bank, you know, the Norwegian um, Investment Fund, and you find the SNB, and those are just the tip of the iceberg. So I think European um, funds, uh, insurance companies, central bank funds like the SMB and the Norwegian Central Bank have invested heavily and won the lottery because the dollar went up and the equities went up. So it's like a double whammy, right? I mean, they were just minting money during this period of time. On the other hand, if they start losing some confidence that the, your, that the US equity market can stay at these kind of levels, you can also have the exact reverse ratchet effect where they sell some of their equities to move them into European equities. You know, they don't bring them home necessarily. It doesn't mean that they buy Norwegian equities or Swiss equities if you're the SMB bank. But you know, they're still held offshore as reserves of the central bank. But now they're in European stocks rather than US stocks. Well, to do that, then they'd also have to sell the dollars associated with those stocks. 
So to me, this is also a slow moving process. This is not something where, you know, these type of holders suddenly from one day to the next turn around and say, oh, we're gonna sell all our US stocks and move them into European stocks. But <coughs> over time, I believe that we're gonna see some of those flows happening and they'll be dollar negative and US equity negative. Um, and again, you know, as, as that starts happening, the dollar starts breaking down, you wanna find currencies around the world that can do better. And so, you know, I've started with these emerging market currencies like we talked about earlier, but over time, I think that'll broaden out into some of the other G10 currencies that will look relatively attractive. And I think it also means that even though in general, I'm very equities. So, I mean, I always say that if you look back 30 years, you know, there've been about 6,600 trading days, 30 years times 220 trading days a year. Well, if randomly you had bought stocks, the S&P on any one of those 6,600 days, you had about an 80% chance that stocks were higher a year later. So in general, you should be betting that, you know, unless you think the world has changed, you have an 80% probability, that's your baseline, that stocks are gonna be higher, right? Unless it's a different world today, you should be betting that stocks are gonna be higher. But I think, you know, one of the things that is different right now is that we have a Fed that's you know, a headwind instead of a tailwind. It's not helping the market. It's actually saying, look, you know, we're trying to tighten the FCI. And tightening the FCI means we want to slow down growth. And if you slow down growth, you probably will be slowing down earnings. So if you put all that together, maybe this is one of those 20% years. You know, like maybe this is one of the years where the equity market doesn't go up. So, you know, it makes me a little bit cautious. I'm way more in cash than I used to be. I think I'm about 45% in cash now um, compared to you know, a much lower number during normal times. Um, and I just wanna be conservative. I just don't think that there's any reason to have a long bet on the US equity market for the next year. I mean, things change. Um, yeah, and and maybe the Fed will start being softer, but you know, right now the Fed's actually every day talking tighter. You know, Bullard is talking about 300 basis points in the first year. Um, Powell was talking about doing 50s. You know, I'd be surprised if we don't see 50s. You know, of course, some of the forward curve is now building that in too, and the equity market still in the last six days has just gone higher. So it's kind of interesting. And I sometimes wonder how that's happening. Is that because um, people have lightened up by enough that they're sitting on enough cash like I am and there's a fear of missing out and that suddenly people are saying, well, maybe things are going to be fine. The Fed's going to be able to you know, thread the needle and, and create a soft landing with lower inflation and the world will be perfect. It's, it's possible, although I don't think it's a high probability bet. Uh, yeah, and, and I think that was a phenomenal answer. <laughs> and you know, when, and you know, when you you know, you started off by talking about currencies, and when it comes to building a currency position, how do you think about you know building that basket of say spot versus forwards versus owning the options? In general, I prefer owning options because I like to hire the counterparty as my risk manager. I love the idea of knowing precisely how much I'm going to lose when I'm wrong. And I'm wrong all the time. So I have no fear of admitting that. You know, when I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Using an option allows me to be much more relaxed about being wrong and rethinking fundamentally why I'm wrong. You know, I'm wrong because of some temporary move, that there is some flow that I hadn't thought about, or you know, is it something that's much more fundamental and I should just change my mind and then just sell my options out and decide that, okay, um, I was wrong. Or maybe the trade is not gonna go as far. So you know, most of the things I've put on are now up in value. If they stopped going up, is that now wrong? Do I start taking my profit or not? 
I like using options also because it gives me a very precise definition of the probability distribution. So when I buy a, a digital option and I, I'm one of the people who love doing digital options, I know that I'm paying X percent of payout. So if I can do a dollar Brazil option at say 440 for the next year, and today we're at 490 and that costs me 15% or whatever it might cost today, I haven't priced things up. Then I know that if it's under that price, I will make six times my money. If it's above that price, I lose my money. Um, and it's kind of a very precise way of saying, do I believe that the market implied probability is the same probability that I have? If it is, then I can't make money. But if the market implied probability is very different from what I have, so if the market says it's only a 10 to one chance that the Indian rupee will just go sideways for three years, and I say, well, 10 to one, that's a pretty small probability. All kinds of good stuff could happen in India. I know that commodities are a bad thing for India, but there are lots of other good things. They have a big plan on how to become a major hand, um, a phone handset um, exporter. You know, if, if India trade manufacturing uh, took off, manufacturing trade took off, um, it could have a large positive effect on the balance of payment. So, you know, I look at those kinds of things and I say, well, you know, like, why would I bet be 90% sure that this will not happen? You're like, why is the market 90% certain that the Indian rupee will not be at the same level or approximately at the same level in three years? I think, well, you know, that's too strong a statement. I can bet against that statement. Um, I tend to look for bets where I think it's, I feel more than 50% certain that I'm going to be right. So if the market's giving me 10 to one odds and I think it should be five to one odds, it's still a good bet, but I'm still probably going to lose money because at five to one against me, I'm still, I'm just saying that 10 to one that, that the market is offering is probably too low, but five to one is still not a great bet. <laughs> I'll just, I'll probably still lose money. But you know, the way to address that is really through the size of the option portfolio rather than to a decision whether you should take that bet or not. I mean, if it has positive expected value, you're probably supposed to take the bet. And then the issue is how large should the bet be? So in Brazil, where I feel, oh, the currency can actually really appreciate, you know, I am positively inclined to it. Whereas in India, I'm not sure. I really don't know if India can go sideways or not. But I like the odds. In Brazil, I feel that the bet of India being, of uh, Brazil being stronger a year from now rather than weaker is higher than 50 50. And you know, at the forward price, <clears throat> the odds should be about 50 50, right? I mean, that's what the forward price is. That's how options or spot and futures and forwards get priced. So that's how I do it. Got it. Um, you know, what, are there any other long-term opportunities that you see that's, you know, excluding the commodity team? So, you know, one thing that you were long was um, uranium. And you, know, you, show, you, you know, briefly discussed uranium and talked about, you know, energy independence for places like Germany uh, and Western Europe from, you know, Russia. And, you know, and, you know when it comes to uranium, you know, do you, do you sort of have an update on that trade? And, you know, how, how, and how are you expressing your position? Though? There, there, you can express it physically through like SPRA versus say a basket of uranium miners. So, so I, I kind of messed it up. I took my profit just because I think it had jumped up and I decided, oh, I want to have smaller equity positions because all my positions were in uranium miners. So I took profit on CCJ uh, and NXE. But I do think that actually on any dip, I should be buying them again. And I think that uranium is a long-term positive bet. You know, the largest uranium producer is Kazakhstan. And, you know, about two months ago, we had riots in the street in Kazakhstan. You don't want to be exposed to that. So you'd rather own a miner in Canada like CCJ or 
know somebody in the U.S. And I do think that central banks uh, will shift some of their reserves, or governments will shift some of their reserves to commodities. And I think part of it will be uranium stockpiles. You know, if you know that you need uranium for your power plants, you'd be crazy to say, well, you know, you guys can just decide to buy that in the spot market at any price in the future, and you know, maybe you won't be able to get it because you know, right now. Russia, for example, is talking about limiting uranium exports. And you know, I think there's more outside pressure on uranium. I mean, it falls into the commodity complex. I hadn't brought it up separately, but it's clearly one of the commodities that I think you ought to be long. I, I think using Sprott is fine. You know, then that way you get a direct exposure to uranium. I think CCJ, is not as clear a bet. I mean, our analysis says that when uranium hits 65 or so, CCJ should be up at 45. <clears throat> now it's around 29. So it still has plenty of room to go. Um, and I, I would think that, you know, one would want to continue to be long. Um, otherwise, I really don't have any new bets. You know, I've been just reading a lot and I've been thinking a lot. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, one thing I learned during COVID, I was thinking about research and how we do research. And I feel that we tend to spend too much time on things that we already know quite a bit about. So, you know, the, the extra knowledge that you gain from reading a little bit more about uranium is worth less than reading something that you just didn't know anything about. So, you know, when I was doing the Gurbich um, interview, I was reading a book on Chinese antitrust, which was something I knew nothing about. And I thought, hmm, now that's something that could influence markets. Um, and that's something interesting to me. Or, you know, reading um, a book on here. This is a book I'm just going to start next. It's called Beyond Fossil Law. Climate Courts and the Fight for a Sustainable Future. So it's, you know, it's about how we can use the law to influence climate change legislation and, and uh, what kind of impact one can get to the courts. I think there's um, an important point here, which is that we need to open ourselves up to random information in order to learn something new. Um, so when you want to learn something new, you need to spend time on it, right? And that's your time where you're exploring something. And sometimes it will lead to something called exploitation. It will teach you something new that you can then exploit. Um, and I think most of us don't spend enough time exploring. We tend to exploit much more. We read about the things that we already know something about. We already have a position in. And yes, you know, we need to stay on top of that if there are changes. But in general, if you have a multi-year view on something, you don't need to read another article about why you think the dollar might do this or that, or you know, why you think uranium can go higher. I mean, I think it's more important to actually spread yourself thinner and learn something new, better spend five, 10, 20% of your time on new inputs yeah. than on redigesting old inputs. And there was a, I think on the Gorovich interview, I kind of mentioned it, it was something that in the 1960s was called the secretary problem. I don't know if you were listening to that, but basically the question is, you know, if you're um, trying to hire the best person you can to be your assistant and you have a hundred resumes, how should you decide to go about Interviewing, what do you do? Like if the, if the rule is, well, you can interview somebody and offer them a job. If you don't offer them a job, they go off and get another job. Well, if you just hire the first one, what's the probability that they're the best out of 100? Well, one out of 100, you know, <laughs> it's a 1% yeah. chance. Right. So the question is, how many should you be interviewing before you make the decision to have a base knowledge? And the answer is one over E. It's about 37%. Um, and the math is a little complex, but you can kind of think of it pretty easily. If you only had three resumes, right? You, if you just randomly chose, you'd have a one third chance of hiring the best person. But if you interview the first person and then 
choose the next person who is better than the first person to hire, if you actually print that out and kind of look at it, you'll see that you have a 50% chance of hiring the best person. So by exploring, you improve your odds. By not hiring the first person, but by using them as a benchmark. And if you Wikipedia, you'll see it's called the secretary problem because in those days people weren't called their assistants. <clears throat> but, um, you know, so in the same way that this problem looks at a hundred resumes, I think of, you know, a week having say 40 or 50 hours and I should allocate about 37% to exploring. So I should allocate on a daily basis out of the eight hours that I want to work two to three to exploring new stuff, reading books that might not seem immediately to have something to do with trading, but might just give me a new idea and point me in the right direction. And I think it's really important, especially in finance where, you know, finance is probably the most interdisciplinary applied study game that you can play in the world. You know, everything has some way of relating or having some application in finance. You know, whether you're reading a novel or you're reading psychology book or an economics book or political science or history or anything, you know, a legal book, there are always ways to kind of bring it back to finance and say, whoa, you know, like this is what this could mean in terms of trading. And so that means that there are infinitely many things to learn and be interested in. And as that happens, if you're a curious kind of person, I think you'll do well in finance. And I think, you know, you should very systematically think about, I want to opportunistically just read things that ex ante, I'm not sure they'll help me. But as I keep doing that, I mean, over the years, I will form mental models that will help me make better decisions in areas that maybe other people don't think are that important, you know, like literature. Um, if you read War and Peace by Tolstoy, you don't think of it as any influence on investing, right? But when you think about, well, you know, here's Napoleon with all his armies invading Russia. Well, oh, maybe that's something to do with Russia invading Ukraine. Let me think if there's some kind of connection there. Yeah. Um, the general, the Russian general who keeps, uh, who actually wins against Napoleon over time, you know, keeps being asked, what are you going to do when they, when they approach Moscow? And his answer is always the same, time and patience. And I kind of think that's fantastic trading advice, time and patience. You know, we all have time. We all have, if we have patience, we're going to be much better at trading. I mean, you know, some of the um, advice that I've seen is the hardest thing in trading is sitting on your hand. Right. Like it's so easy to, to convince yourself that you have a good idea. Let me just do something. But, you know, the 50-50 trades that you do just spur of the moment might not be the best ones for your long-term track record. So I think we learn by allowing ourselves to um, have random influences in our lives. And we should very systematically try to do that. Yeah, 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 and and you know, you know, on that topic of you know picking out random, uh, on that topic, you know, when it comes to trading effectively, you know, when you spoke to Kevin Muir on the Market Huddle podcast, you sort of mentioned the importance of curating information to maximize signal and minimize noise. And you now, what is your top advice in managing this process and trading effectively, considering that at least, you know, at the current moment, you know, there, there is a lot of noise relative to signal, you know, with the war, with everything that's going on. So now how do you think about curating information to maximize, or maximize the signal to noise ratio? So I think the word curating really is related to curator. You know, a curator is the person who in the museum decides what to hang, how to create shows, etc. And I feel I have curators around the world. So all the people I deal with know that I want to know from them where they see a signal, where they see something of value. So, you know, I get about 2,000 emails a day. Do you think I can read 2,000 emails a day? No, no. way. I probably don't read more than 25. But when my salesperson from Goldman Sachs calls up and says, oh, we put out a really interesting piece on Latin America. 
And these are our views now. Then I'll make sure to read that one because they're telling me that there's signal in there. They've spent time doing the research. And so I think having friends around the world helps you in curation. I think it's a really important thing to have enough friends that you can <clears throat> rely on. So I have friends in Turkey who will say to me, I think there's something special happening in this IPO. That's a signal because they are in Turkey and they have time to think about their market. They're going to know more about that market than I ever will. I think the other thing is to not feel badly about that random 37% of time that you're supposed to allocate to these new ideas, things that you didn't know about. You probably won't find many signals in them, but the ones that you do find will be very interesting and other people will not have them, which will differentiate you from the crowd and allow you to make the kind of decisions you know, where you are better at evaluating forward-looking probabilities than the rest of the market because you have a wider sense of ideas. So you know, I think curation happens really with friends and having a network. Um, and otherwise, I never feel the need to finish reading something. So I'm very good at just reading the introduction and reading the conclusion of a book and kind of going like, okay, that's enough. I got the idea. I don't need to read the whole book or I don't need to read the whole research report. Um, <clears throat> I'm uh, subscribing, which anybody can do, it's free, to some called SSRN, which is Social Science Research Network. And they will send out compilations of new academic articles just with the abstract. So you know, an abstract is probably like six sentences long. You can read six sentences and go like, nah, not for me, not interesting, don't need to know about it. But you can also read six sentences and go like, that's interesting. I think I want to delve deeper into that. Yeah, so. yeah. And yeah, so that like, you know, you're able to sort of Split, you know, what's interesting and, you know, what you think is useful versus, you know, what's less interesting and what's less useful, right? So. Although, you know, usefulness is also hard to measure because if the actual act of satisfying your curiosity makes you happy, <clears throat> then it's useful, right? Yeah. We tend to measure usefulness a little bit too much by does it help us make money or not? And really in the big picture, as long as we're making enough to lead a financially secure life, then everything else is gravy and we ought to have better plans on what to do with that and how to give it away and how to make the world a better place, which is probably way more important than, you know, adding another zero to your net worth. It's been great talking to you. We spent yeah, an hour agree. again. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. You know, Jim, you know, just to wrap up the podcast, any closing thoughts or any closing pieces of advice that you would like to give to um, biggest investors listening to this podcast? Um, you know, I think the people who listen to you tend to be younger. So all I can say to them is, you know, don't be in a rush. Take your time. Be curious. Read a lot. Follow your passions. There are so many interesting things happening in the world and in all of them, you can find an edge. You know, if you're interested in science, you can delve deeper into technology. You can look at fusion versus nuclear, different kinds of power plants. And suddenly you go like, well, this is something interesting. I wonder how that could be expressed as a trade. You know, I like the idea of converting things into trades because it's fun for me. <clears throat> Well, that's the advice I have to all the young people. Just don't waste your time. Have fun, read, be curious, and keep asking questions. Yep. And, you know, with that, Jim, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It is, it's been awesome talking to you once again. And, you know, we should, we should do this again in a few months' time. Sounds good, Tree. You take good care. Good luck to you. Yep. Thank you.